Oh my gosh. I think this is perfect, honestly. Hello, kids. Hi. Nice to see you again. I'm back so soon. Wow. Fionn's on a roll. I wasn't sure what to film next. I decided one of the ideas I've had for a long time is to make a video on another physicist, on Schrodinger. If you remember back, I'll link it in the iCard, whichever place it is in. I did a video on Ludwig Boltzmann, who was a very, very, very influential physicist who inevitably ended up ending his own life. And, you know, just hearing about little bits of personal life of some of these, like, famous scientists, physicists, really, really fascinated me. And eventually ended up looking deeper into Schrodinger himself. Obviously, you may or may not know, I also have a video always self-promoing that's the way forward <laughs> about my tattoos and one of them is based on Schrodinger's cat and obviously throughout studying physics I learned about many many physicists including him and the important influential bits of work that he put out in like quantum mechanics and whatnot but something that I find very very fascinating that isn't often delved into as much is the personal lives of these very famous people. They are known for the work that they put out, but they aren't so much, you know, they're still real human beings with real lives and it'd be cool if people knew more about who they were as people. So that's kind of what I've done again with Schrodinger and I'm going to talk to you about him. I will say Eleanor Neal style, <laughs> um, like she does true crime cases, if you've not heard of Ele Eleanor Neal then I don't know what side of YouTube you're on, but you know, you should check her out. But as with this being a real life person with real life family and descendants, I want to remind you that I am not a professional of any sort. I am making this video off of just internet research, um, some of which is sources like Wikipedia, which <laughs> may not be too, you know, incredibly sound and reliable. But I still think it's interesting to put all this together just with the caveat of reminding you that there's a possibility that not 100% of what I'm going to say is going to be 100% correct. If I was wrong about something, please respectfully tell me in the comments because I don't want to spread misinformation and I don't want to disrespect anyone. I just want to tell you more that I could find about a really cool influential man. So. The fact of the matter is that they're just, they're real human beings and these like famous or otherwise people that you hear of had their own personal lives and things that happened to them and they did things wrong here and there even if you think they must have been a perfect wonderful human being. It's not always the case. So I wrote my notes in my Einstein book. A lot of these people, which I also find very interesting, lived in the same sort of time period in like the early to mid 1900s. And I can just imagine like all of these like big major scientists like sat around a table talking about crazy physics theories and philosophy and arguing about the state of matter and <laughs> all sorts. It, it just it's really interesting to me that they all kind of lived at the same time and a lot of them knew each other. Let's start talking about Schrodinger. So Erwin Rudolf Josef Alexander Schrodinger, many middle names there, was born the 12th of August 1887 and he died the 4th of January 1961. He was an Austrian-Irish physicist. So he was born in Austria, Vienna, I believe, and he eventually, at one point, migrates to Ireland and lives there for a time. His parents were Rudolf Schrod Schrodinger and Georgine Amelia Brenda Schrodinger, originally Bauer, and he was an only child. I know his dad at least was a botanist. His mother was half Austrian, half English, and his father was, I'm assuming, fully Austrian. So he was raised in a household that was predominantly Christian, so his dad was more on the Catholic side and his mother was more a branch, one of the largest branch as one of the largest branches of Protestantism, of Christianity. So two different sides of the coin, but they come together and have an only child, which is Owen. So in his early years, he was a pretty standard kid, pretty gifted. He went to the local, what they called gymnasium at the time, which is just a school, and he did pretty well for himself. He was interested in science from a young age, but he was also really fascinated by like German poetry and stuff, which I think is cool. 
people are multifaceted. <laughs> then it comes to him getting to 1906. In 1906 he began his doctorate at the University of Vienna and he studied under a man called Hazen, Hazen, Hazenall? Hazenall? I'll put his name up there again because I'm probably going to mispronounce everything. Who, fun fact, connections are everywhere, was actually Boltzmann's successor. So after completing his doctorate, still in Austria in Vienna, he then became an assistant to one of the people he also worked under for his doctorate, Franz S. Exner. And this was all under a department of physics, naturally. So from a young age, actually, he was influenced strongly by Arthur Schopenhauer, so that's another famous name that we link in. Then we move on to 1914, three years later, where he eventually achieves what is called habitation, which I, as far as I can tell is like a step towards professorship, so he was going to, getting towards the place where he would then be like lecturing students and teaching students in a university. Very cool. Despite that, however, as you may or may not remember, 1914 was the start of the First World War. So it was then from 1914 until 1918 that he was drafted in under the Austrian army in the Austrian fortress artillery, is what it's called. If I keep looking down, it's because I'm reading my notes. I hope that's not too annoying and distracting. So even though he'd gotten his doctorate and was intending to start working as a professor, he ended up having to take a detour to help in the war. In It was then in tw 1920, a hundred years ago, that he was then able to begin work in education and finally become a professor in 1921. 1920 was also the year that Schrodinger married his wife Annie Patel which we'll get more into in a bit because to me this is probably one of the most interesting parts was his like personal life rather than his, his academic career but we'll get there don't worry he worked from places like Stuttgart and eventually ended up working in an area of Poland as you know as a professor educating people in physics by 1921 though he moved to the University of Zurich, which he later looked back on as one of his, you know, favourite times of his life. It was in 1926, only five years later, maths, wow, so good at maths, me. It was in 1926 that Schrodinger's wave equation, he saw the work of Bohr, Niels Bohr, something like that, and he thought, nope, that's not I don't like that, that's not good enough. So he worked on his wave equations as an alternative. Uh, it was in 1927 that he moved to Germany, Berlin. So this guy did a lot of mo moving around to different universities to work on there. And he succeeded Max Planck at the Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin. However, just six years later, the Nazis started coming to power in Germany and Schrodinger didn't like that. Schrodinger did not support Nazism, Hitler, anybody in the party or anything that that stood for. So he left Germany and it was that, at that point that he ended up in the UK and he became a fellow at the University of Oxford, which is very cool. Fun fact. My dad did his PhD at the University of Oxford many years later, but they were at the same place. Well, that was pretty, that was pretty cool. <laughs> it was here that he worked with another famous physicist called Paul Dirac. If you ever study physics or anything of the sort, then you might have heard his name too, the like Dirac equations and things like that. And it was with him, Paul Dirac, that he shared the Nobel Prize in 1933 for their work on the Schrodinger equations. He also won a number of other awards at different points in his life but from this point on he saw some difficulties at his place at Oxford because of his unconventional living situation. So as I told you before Schrodinger married a woman called Annie Bertel in 1920 
at some point, either before or after this, he also started seeing a woman called Mrs. Hilda March. Now, Mrs. Hilda March, Arthur March, was one of Schrodinger's Austrian colleagues, and it just so turned out that Schrodinger fell in love with his wife, <laughs> and Annie Battelle also became a lover of Arthur March. So it kind of, the physics world around there just kind of became a little bit incestuous, I guess. And yeah, Hilda, Hilda March became Schrodinger's mistress. And Schrodinger, his wife, and his mistress all ended up living together for a good while. She moved to the UK with him. She eventually moved to Ireland with them both as well. Annie Mattel was actually barren and she couldn't have children, so... Schrodinger and Battelle themselves never um, had children together, but Hilda March did mother one of his daughters, Ruth, George, Erica, she ended up being named. Yeah, so the three of them raised Hilda and Schrodinger's <laughs> daughter. The Ruth ended up calling Annie Battelle her godmother, and she actually grew to like Annie Battelle more than Hilda March because she thought Hilda March was a bit too strict. But they all three lived together for a time. Ruth was born in 1934, by the way, so probably just around the time they had both, or all three of them, moved to the UK. So, as I was saying, his position at Oxford was basically they dismissed him. University of Oxford decided that upon knowing about his menage a trois living situation that they did not approve of it and they dismissed him as a member of their staff so Schrodinger at that point had to find other work. In 1934 he carried out a lecture in Princeton in the US and was offered a permanent position there but again this didn't really work out because they found out about him living with his wife and his mistress and they didn't approve of it either, so he got turned away from a job there at Princeton. He was persistent though, he still wanted to live with his wife and his mistress. They eventually, in 1936, moved to Austria again, and he then worked under the University of Graz. I think, again, I think this was the university I also mentioned in the video about Bonsman, so everything is interconnected, it's so cool. In between this, in 1935, was where the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment was born when Owen Schrodinger was having the issues with getting a tenured position somewhere at a university so that he had a secure career to fall back on. During all of these issues he shared correspondence with good old Einstein and it was there that they talked about what was later be called the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. Basically he laid it out this way metaphorically and almost poetically I guess because he found the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics so incredibly ridiculous. That's where this thought experiment actually came from is he tried to use it to express his, you know, he felt that it was absurd, the Copenhagen interpretation. That's where Schrodinger's cat thought experiment came from in 1935. In 1938 however, somewhere around 1938 the war was ever approaching and Austria, I believe, got absorbed by Germany. So Austria became a part of Germany. Schrodinger's living situation came under threat at that point because it was known that he had had, you know, a disagreement with the Nazi regime and the Nazis were coming to power and they were becoming pretty dictatorial and they didn't like the fact that he'd spoken against them and he'd left the country. It was seen as a very bad sign. It was at this point that in 1938 he had to flee Germany because the Nazis didn't like him. Um, so he ended up he ended up recanting his opposition to the Nazis at this point in an attempt to not have any controversy, not have any opposition to his situation, and they didn't accept it anyway. So he ended up fleeing to Italy at this point. He was dismissed from his job for political unreliability, is what they called it. Sometime after fleeing to Italy, he wanted to move to Ireland at this point. He had had troubles getting visas. He was trying to get his mistress a visa to go live with them 
too. But I think they eventually did manage it because they were invited by the Prime Minister of the time, who was also a mathematician, to come help set up the Institute of Advanced Studies in Dublin. So they all moved to Ireland. And it was there he became a director for the School of Theoretical Physics in 1940, which he stayed working there for a whole 17 years. So it was a pretty fruitful decision in the end to move to Ireland. In 1948, he became a Irish citizen at that point. Uh, I think a couple sources say different things, but I think he kept his Austrian citizenship and made it a dual citizenship with Ireland. Around this time, before and after, he wrote a further 50 papers on different subjects, including unified field theory, which is a problem that has still not been solved. Scientists to this day are still working on and do not have the solution to unified field theory. So to briefly explain what that is, there are a handful of known forces such as gravity, electromagnetism, strong force and the weak force. I may be missing one. If I am, I will post something up here to show you what the main forces are. And this unified field theory was in an attempt to link everything. And they did find links between a lot of the different things and particles for the corresponding forces, but it is not fully solved. Largely because everyone's confused about gravity. There have been, you know, progress on that side of things in more recent years that I don't fully know too, too much about, but yeah, it's still something that isn't completely solved. And it's kind of thought of as like the last big thing that the physicists need to work on is bringing everything together, tying it up in a neat little bow, a neat little bow so that everything makes complete sense, you know? That's what unified field theory is, I think. He also, in 1944, going back a few years, wrote a book called What is Life, which was actually more philosophical than to do with physics, although it did include topics of, is this negentropy here? And the concept of the complex molecule with the genetic code for living organisms. And it was actually this book that inspired the people who eventually discovered the like double helix DNA molecule. So a physicist was very influential in that development in biology. That is pretty cool to me. The main name that I've got written here was James D. Watson, who researched the gene and then discovered the DNA double helix in 1953. And it was this book that helped that happen. Ireland is where Schrodinger remained until retiring tiring in 1955. That's the main place he lived until he retired. In 1956, he ended up returning to Vienna, eventually, after all that time of having the difficulties with the Nazis and the First World War and the Second World War, Austria and Germany and the Anschluss, he finally went back to Vienna. It was here, at the World Energy Conference, that he actually refused to speak on nuclear energy because he was very sceptical of its uses and the dangers and everything like that. So instead he, at this point, talked about a philosophy lecture instead at the World Energy Conference. He actually had a lifelong interest in what's, what I've written here is called the Vedanta philosophy of Hinduism, which is really, really cool. So he was very interested in things like consciousness and how the individual consciousness links to what he believed to be like a universal consciousness then it, everything is all connected in that sense, which I think is extremely fascinating. And, you know, you see physicists in the past doing so much more work on things like philosophy than you would imagine, because, um, I don't know, I always kind of thought that maybe people who are heavy into the sciences, pure science, things like that, would probably look down upon things like philosophy as just being fantasy and, you know, not useful too unempirical, you know, you can't prove any of it, it's all just a wondering. But yeah, I remember mentioning that Boltzmann had an interest in philosophy too, so it happens more than you think that people are into science but they're also into thinking more about how the world works on a different level, like philosophy. He, through much of his life, suffered with tuberculosis and it was that that would eventually end up killing him. But he did spend several long spans of time at what they called a sanatorium, but is actually a hospital. My mind immediately went to, oh my god, did, was he on a psych unit? But 
it was just another word for a hospital, a long-standing medical facility. And it was at this, these different sanatoriums that he actually wrote some of his best work. That's where he formulated the wave equation. So the rest of what I'm going to say is probably going to be a bit more haphazard because I, I managed to gather a timeline of notes throughout his life more so, but then whilst looking at different sources here and there I found little other bits of information that are interesting to include too, so I'll give you that as well. It is thought that Schrodinger's living situation with his wife and his mistress was not the only sort of escapade. <laughs> that Schrodinger had. He actually kept a very detailed, meticulous diary of his numerous sexual encounters, even including a allegedly teenage girl whom he seduced whilst he was her maths teacher. And she, supposedly, allegedly, was also impregnated. So it's, again, one of the things that I struggled to find, I did really, really look into it, was information on his children. They have Decent information on Ruth, whom Schrodinger, Annie and Hilda raised, but it is definitely thought that he fathered children to at least two more of his other escapades. And, you know, one of these could be the teenage girl he impregnated. Again, I could not find definite details. One source said that he had three children in total, but I couldn't find any other information on the supposed other two daughters that he had besides Ruth so that's kind of up in the air I'm not really sure on that one but yeah he got a teenage girl pregnant when he was her maths tutor that's a bit crazy isn't it um so oh and this was all during his time in Ireland by the way that he like fathered several children but it was all a consensual situation I'm not sure if I've stressed that enough yet but nobody in this scenario was unaware of each other as far as I know. As far as I've read, definitely Annie and Hilda of course knew about each other and they accepted it. They were happy with it. Annie was even sleeping with Hilda's husband <laughs> and someone else I found as well. Where is that? Uh, somewhere I've got a different lover of Annie's. Somebody called Herman, Herman Vale. Again, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but he was also a lover of Annie. So Schrodinger slept around had several children, but so did his wife, and they all loved each other. Annie and Schrodinger remained married till his death, and even though Schrodinger is like recorded to have said that he was in love with Hilda March too, it was all a situation that they all wanted to stay in. So it's just very interesting, um, especially in a, the sort of time periods where I can only imagine it was less accepted to be in such a like polyamorous, polygamous set up but you know power to them i i like it it's <laughs> it's fascinating to read about i just i never knew this before looking into him, him in more depth he's known most commonly of course for his advancements in physics and the schrodinger's cat thought experiment but he also <laughs> he also lived with two women <laughs> This is, ah, it's just fascinating. Annie never left his side till he died at 73 due to his tuberculosis. Annie then died four years later in 1965. As you may or may not know, he's thought of to be one of several individuals who is given the honour title of the father of quantum mechanics, so he's like one of the first people to bring about such influential theories and equations and works relating to matter and particles on an even smaller scale than like, you know, atoms on the periodic table and even electrons and neutrons and even smaller than that. He was one of the first people to work in that field and to bring it about. He was revolutionary. In physics. There's actually a crater on the other side, like the dark side of the moon, named after him, which I found really interesting too. Uh, <laughs> at one point after his death, in 18, no, 1983 to 1997, he featured on an Austrian banknote. I think it was the second highest denomination. Schrodinger's face was on a banknote. Really cool. I have a bit more written down about his daughter. She was born in Oxford, 
So yes, before they moved to Ireland, I guess, Ruth thought of, even though she was called her godmother, Ruth thought of Annie Patel as her second mother. So it literally was like the three of them, like a throuple, raised Ruth together. But I'm assuming then that if Schrodinger fathered other children, that he wasn't really a part of their lives. Again, I couldn't find any details on that, even though I did try. I'm very interested to know who these other, like, descendants of Schrodinger might be. He must not, must not have been part of their lives, so there's going to be little knowledge on who they are and what they may or may not have done in their lives. So a lot of, well, a lot of some of the information that we can gather about Schrodinger now, as well as coming from people like his daughter, comes from his vast correspondence that he kept a record of. So at some point it was discovered that there was this very large, very heavy box of all of his correspondence, all of his letters to people, and eventually, eventually I think it became available to the public, but there was one point where the University of Vienna and Ruth herself were fighting over the ownership of the box and it was eventually decided that the box should be available for, you know, the public to gain further knowledge of Schrodinger because it's, has, it's essentially a historical record of someone who was globally renowned so I think it ended up with the University of Vienna and I think there were several people who made like copies and records of all of the correspondence in those papers for like public display eventually. So it wasn't just quantum mechanics that he published works on, he actually published works in fields such as biology, cosmology, philosophy, religion, classical studies and more. He was a very versatile, very clever, very bright man, very influential man. I can't speak on his character much besides finding a record I think written by Ruth herself saying that obviously Schrodinger got very absorbed in his work and he would always be in his study doing his work and if anyone were to disturb him he would get very angry. <laughs> That's one of the only things that I could find about his character in particular. He must have been quite the ladies man. He was clearly somewhat forward thinking given his relationship situation. He lived through major historical events and, you know, had to escape Germany at one point. Another thing that maybe moderately could put his character on the more negative side is that he went back on his statements about, you know, damning the Nazi regime. He recounted that and later in life he is said to have been very regretful of it and apologised to Einstein himself, who was Jewish and German. I mean, he denounced the Nazis, then he recounted that statement, and then he later regretted it. This was like several levels of regret, and you know, maybe he would have been a better person just to stick by his guns and never recount his statement, but then everyone at the time obviously was incredibly afraid of the Nazis, and the Nazis killed a lot of people for less, so... I mean, he, he overall, from what I can see and read about him, he's an, an incredibly interesting guy, not just for what he did for physics. He had, he lived an interesting life. <laughs> he lived a, an experienced life and it, it has been very, very interesting to look into and I hope that you enjoyed hearing about it. I don't know if I told the story of his life well. I haven't watched back the Boltzmann video for a long time, so I don't know whether I did that any justice to his life. But, you know, of course, that's what I want to do. I want to do... I want to be respectful and, you know, do good things for their history and their legacy, you know? Um, I don't know who the remaining descendants of Schrodinger are, but I would never want them to be upset about, um, about my telling of his story. It's likely they'll never see this, obviously. <laughs> I find it all incredibly interesting and if I have gotten anything wrong or been in any way disrespectful, I hope I haven't, but yeah, if you would let me know. Obviously it's the last thing that I want to do, but I, yeah, I would deeply apologise if I have done any of those things. 
because I, I, I love, I love stories like this and people like this and yeah, I guess I'm making, I want to make videos like this in the Vion Talks Physicist series I suppose to get more people to know about them because yeah, these are people beyond what they are commonly known for. Like even any, any, any historical figure for whatever they've done, you know, they're probably most commonly known because of the things that they did in the world, but they were also human beings that were a product of their time and the experiences and the situations that they went through. And yeah, they, they're more than, they're more than what they're most commonly known for. They were still human beings just like us at the end of the day. Like there's something so incredibly remarkable about them, of course, which is why their names go down in history. And a lot of them are household names. I imagine if you said the word Schrodinger to almost anyone that wasn't like a literal child, <laughs> they would probably at least know him for Schrodinger's cat. So yeah, I mean, he's remarkable, he's fascinating, but he was still a human being. We all make mistakes. But I'm really glad I finally made this video. I hope it's good enough. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please have a lovely, beautiful day. Stay safe.